Well, it's been an emotional day in South Africa, being forced to look at the question of transformation in the higher education sector once again. And uh, once again, at the cost of a life, we'll play back to you the scenes uh, that have made it onto the headlines and sparked fierce conversation in uh, the public domain. Hello and welcome. This is the full view, the final hour. And uh, let's get straight to that. The Student Representative Council of the University of Cape Town saying it stands in solidarity with students facing exclusions at tertiary institutions across the country. It's reacting, of course, to today's protest by VIT students in Bramfontein in Johannesburg, during which a man was shot dead and two students wounded during clashes with police. <laughs> All right, uh, these are last pictures uh, in the Bromfontein CBD in Zinga where students are now marching in front of the pathology van that is taking the deceased uh, to uh, the mortuary at this stage. We're going to stand right here at the moment and let them go through us at the moment. And you'll see the visuals that are here and that um, I'm not sure what I would say the numbers are at this point. But uh, them marching before uh, the uh, pathology van, uh, the 31-year-old man, of course, who was caught uh, in the uh, scuffle between police uh, as well as uh, students a bit earlier on. And um, they feel that it's, uh, it would only be decent, uh, dignified if they could do so while the circumstances are being investigated at this point in terms of... Um, what exactly had transpired? Let's just move towards this direction now. Uh, we'll come back, uh, and Zinga, on this particular point. We'll show you right here on the top as we move uh, a bit closer to where you have uh, the Johannesburg City offices where students have now moved towards. I'll just check. Uh, we're on the corner now of Bickard Street. On the corner of Bickard at the moment where students have now moved ahead of um, that uh, pathology van. You'd, uh, you forgive me a bit then, Zinga, while investigations are taking place at this particular point, but the circumstances that led to uh, the, the exact cause of uh, what we do know, of course, he was shot. And uh, if respons police were responsible for that, uh, either through live ammunition or rubber bullets, this is information that, of course, um, they would want quite clear as soon as possible. So I'll try and see if we can't bring in some of the... So these were the scenes that played out uh, earlier on. And of course, it's within the context of South Africa's historical past, uh, the access to higher education, especially affordable higher education. And of course, uh, looking at uh, post-1994, the promises made on transforming the sector, there's wide-ranging imperatives and goals that have been set by democratic uh, government of South Africa and this is what upset a lot of viewers earlier on across the country as students sang struggle songs insulting the police after a man was shot dead during those student protests in Johannesburg earlier on. I'm sure some of you may have heard, heard the words that they sang, uh, but uh, criticism being leveled against the Department of Higher Education. We now know that the Minister of Higher Education, Dr. Blade Insimande, will address the nation tomorrow to clarify on statements made earlier on saying that there wasn't enough money to fund some students at entry level of university and uh, those who were meant to be beneficiaries of NSFAS. We're joined now by Bongani Maslangu, who is the national executive of uh, SAUS, the South African University of Students, and Dr. Uh, Linda Mayer, who's director of operations and sector support university South Africa, to talk about this. A very good evening to you both, uh, Linda and Bongani. 
Let me start with you, Bongani, just very briefly, and I'm going to ask you in as brief as possible, 30 seconds, to just give us your views of how we should categorize the events that we saw earlier on. Bongani? So basically, um, thanks for inviting us. Um, so basically, uh, load shading, I don't know, can you guys see me? We can hear you, that's can more important, yes. Okay, yeah, no, as long as you can hear me. Um, so basically what we are seeing is what happened today with the loss of life, that is um, a result, a direct result of fiscal consolidation that has been implemented by Treasury. So when you cut spending in higher education, and you expect higher education to operate as normal, it provokes um, the strikes that we see. Because basically the strikes that we see is they call for an increase of spending. But what we saw from Treasury, the mid-term budget um, policy statement in October of last year, is that there was cutting of fundings in higher education. And then what happened this year in the budget speech is that there was no okay. allocation to the um, um, higher education. And these are the reactions of that. Okay, and hopefully, Bongani, we will uh, be able to play back what the minister's spokesperson said on what has kept uh, them in this uh, uh, immobile, inertia state. Let's hear from you, Linda. What are your thoughts? I mean, we spoke to Satu earlier on who was saying that surely government should have anticipated that what uh, COVID would have done to, uh, you know, many students and their caregivers, meaning increase the number of people who'd want to apply for NSFS funds. What are your thoughts? Thank you. So I think the, the first issue is that, that we need to acknowledge that the system systemically needs to change and there needs to be policy certainty and financial security within the higher education system. We can't be dealing with this issue every year where the missing middle students, which make up 20% of the student population, have no means of registering at universities or salvaging their historic debts. So, so that's, I think, the most important thing. In terms of the NISFAS funding, it was to be expected in the delays in announcement and also the, the message that the NISFAS funding would be cut, that we could have expected that there would be great unhappiness in the system because students would be facing financial exclusions from institutions. It is not an ideal situation to expect students not to be able to register. And, and uh, I, uh, so just to, to say that it is, is really, I don't think that ourselves and South have a very different opinion about that financial stability okay. needs to be created in the system and that we need to start dealing with issues from a systemic level, so that we have right. long-term solutions Bongani, I want in to, terms of, of financial security. I want to bring you in on that. To your uh, mind, and according to the other student unions that you have been speaking to, the funding assessment, had it been done, had it been completed in time for the higher education department to be able to make the determination and make the announcement that there wasn't enough money? I yes, think that uh, we, Bongani, please, can I get you to answer that question? Um, basically, that's what we would expect, because as we have said, as even the doctor has said it, that this is now an annual event. After the publishing of metric results, it's the funding issue. And uh, the minister has had up until 2018, 2019, 2020 to ensure that there is policy certainty with regards to funding, and that has not happened. It's 2021 now, there's still policy uncertainty, and this is the direct cause of having policy uncertainty. And now, coupled with that, you find that austerity measures are being put in place. So even if the minister does come tomorrow with that policy that he's going to present tomorrow, our fear is that it's going to come at a cost of other subsidies in the sector, such as your university development grant, infrastructure grant, which will compromise um, the quality of teaching and learning, which will compromise um, capacity in terms qualitatively and quantitatively in the sector that will in the long run again provoke further strikes. So it's going to be cut here to, to, to add there. And that is not what we want when we talk about an increase in spending in the sector of which if you would go far back as 1999 there was a, a, a significant cut in spending in the sector because um, higher education was not a priority of the government then. Okay. And it was due to the protest of 2015 and 2016 that government has begun a process 
process of taking higher education serious and as, we will, uh, uh, as far as it relates to its budget. And we'll get to some of those issues, but I just want to quickly uh, look at the model as well. We were, we've heard from even Scopa that the NSFAS uh, system is obsolete and it's been said that it's a model that has been um, you know, brought from abroad, Linda. Tell me, is it suitable for our context? As in, from what we hear, the model looks at marks, and that's how it makes the determination of who qualifies. Are we wrong in understanding this? As in, is it correct for the South African context, this model? So we must remember the way that the system works is that anybody that is eligible, for example, the category of, of beneficiaries from SASA, if the household is from SASA, these students are given priority because they are obviously coming from, from poor households. In terms of the eligibility for, for enrollment in universities, each program has a specific set of criteria, and if the student meets that, there's no reason why they would be excluded if they meet the NISFAS requirements for the student to be funded. Mm -hmm. I think this is the, the real question really is, are we doing enough to fund the higher education sector? If 60% of students are NISFAS beneficiaries and the system, the entire higher education system is run with approximately 100 billion rand, is our priorities correct? And are we making sufficient provision for students that are in the missing middle category, but also postgraduate students? Because we're seeing funding being cut from, for example, the, the National Research Foundation, and, and this is not... This is not good for the higher education sector. We need to start having pragmatic discussions about what is best for the country, for economic growth, and certainly cutting funding out of the higher okay. education sector is not helpful on any level mm. for us to advance uh, economic and, and fiscal stability. And I think, Bongani, you did speak to that, mm -hmm. the fact that the contribution by government to universities has decreased. But there's also been a significant rise in terms of tuition above inflation increases. We also know that there's been a, a sharp increase in, in tertiary education fees, including uh, the export of materials uh, used for learning and teaching. Where are we failing to strike that balance? As a student, as a representative of unions who represent these students, how do they process all of these fundamentals? Um, it goes back to what I said earlier, which it comes back to spending. If you look at um, higher education spending um, as a percentage of GDP in South Africa, it is still below international levels, still below um, your OECD um, um, countries, it's still below your BRICS average and still below other states that are in a similar economic um, setup as South Africa. So now, if you do not push that up, up to a certain level, an acceptable level, we are still going to experience the shortage of material, um, shortage of this and that and that, which in the student sense results into strikes. And equally, with that being said, when there is underspending in the sector, the, the shortfall or the difference has to be covered by students in a sense of tuition and an increase in tuition. That's how universities then cover the shortfall. Okay. And then you find that the students do not have the means then to cover that shortfall, which le then leads to uh, outstanding debt or debt towards universities. And students will not have the money now to pay universities, which then translate into strikes. Because if you look at the protests um, in South Africa for I don't know how many years, often they're not around 70% of the protests. By students which disrupts teaching and learning are finance related they're not related to our okay bugari we are losing you will try and come back to you linda mm -hmm. it is that same mm -hmm. data mm -hmm. that says that compared uh, to 13 mm -hmm. countries that bongani is comparing it then finds that south africa has very little room to maneuver in terms of uh, the capacity to fund free tertiary education so what needs to be done? Are we supposed to be looking at new models of higher education? We certainly need to look at new models of education, but also how we prioritize spending. It's, it's uh, for universities that are reliant on block grants and uh, on subsidies that, that they receive from government, and then obviously student funding and third stream revenue sources. But there needs to be a balance reached where we decide what is a priority within the South African economy. And we can't, 
we can't conceivably think that spending less in higher education can be a good thing. Okay. It's, we need the skills, we need the talent to grow the economy, and also we, we have a, a vast pool of talented youth that we need to skill because this is our future. And cutting on higher education is really the last area where we should be okay. looking to cut. Well, honey, I want to want you and Linda to listen to this. We spoke briefly to the Minister of Ed Higher Education spokesperson, and this is what he said about the earlier announcement and why there's possibly a different announcement tomorrow. Please listen to this and tell me if there is a consensus on what was the understanding of the circumstances leading to this point. He has engaged uh, with the Minister of Finance, and uh, today, which was Wednesday, there will be a cabinet meeting to discuss this matter further, because in, in matters that okay. affect money, there must be concurrence with cabinet. And such a meeting took place, and a decision has been taken, and um, the minister will announce tomorrow. You would recall that uh, if you review the year 2020, mm. we had COVID-19, and we had to extend the help that ordinarily will give to the students um, in our country where to extend the academic year, pay the accommodation, give them the allowances that uh, ordinarily they would not get because of who would have been in recess. Now, all of that affected the cash flow within the National Student Financial Aid Scheme. And we had to do so because we could not leave our students vulnerable at the time. And uh, when the appropriation came for this year, we therefore in advance indicated to government, to cabinet, that there would be a shortfall. Linda, you've been listening to that. Unfortunately, um, we've lost contact with Bongani. Hopefully, we'll bring him back. Just comparing, okay, I believe, Bongani, you are back as well. Just to what, listening to what some students were saying, that the complaint was that government did not, through NSFAS, mention soon enough that students qualify. And yet here we've been told by the Department of Higher Education that because they didn't want to disadvantage anyone, they, didn't, they said they didn't have enough money. But in the past, my understanding is that they'd say to universities, um, allow people to register, but we'll delay payment. Linda? So I think that, uh, you know, there's, there's a number of compounding issues that contributed to the very difficult situation. The first is the late release of the NSC results. That, that a provision had to be made. And in terms, another a very big problem that we're sitting with is that many students that didn't previously qualify for NISFAS funding have now qualified. So their parents have, have fallen into the, the category of qualification, now having lost their jobs and all these uh, terrible issues that have happened to them during the COVID-19 period. So we can see that almost 100,000 of these students in second, third, and fourth year now fall into the NISFAS pool. I, I don't want to put all the blame at the, at the Department of Higher Education and Training because they receive a budget from Treasury. And it is very important that we start thinking about these things ahead and find, start finding solutions for the categories of students that really have no other alternatives but to find funding from government or from sources that can are able to support them All to right. their higher education career. Thank you very much uh, to both of you. Bongani Masangu, who is a national executive of SAUS, and Dr. Linda uh, Meyer, who's a director of operations and sector support University South Africa. And of course, uh, as you know, some of the demands by students is they want uh, free registration for all students during the 2020 academic year. Will that happen when the minister makes his announcement tomorrow? We'll find out. Well, uh, that's how we come to the end of that sect of uh, the program looking at the education issues. But